in his life that he's truly repentant. Is that what it means? Because that's an explanation that is given today by scholars. Scholars that believe that Saturday is the correct day to go to church. So what does it mean that he took, that he cannot, he, he, we do not have a high priest that cannot identify with our infirmities. He's been there where we are. He, he did it in us, folks. Mm -hmm. He redeemed us in himself, mm -hmm. within himself. Ah. Oh. Temptations is probably trying to be human and not use his divine nature. Is Satan stupid? I'm not saying that he make a bad choice in heaven. I'm asking, is he stupid? Does he know that God cannot be tempted? Does he understand that? Then why did he tempt Jesus three times? It was a last ditch effort. Because he knew that Jesus was quite vulnerable. Why? Why was Jesus vulnerable? Why was Jesus vulnerable? Because he was born of flesh. Because he knew he had taken on, and that was the only way that he could ethically and legally save us. Do you see that? You know, I think of the thief on the cross who realized that when he said to the other thief, he has done nothing wrong. He realized that Jesus was sinless. What's the concept here? Jesus became everything that I am in order so that I can become everything that yes. Do you like that? Yes. Yeah. Is that biblical or does that just sound nice? That I just worded this nicely. Remember 2 Corinthians 5 21? For he, God, hath made him to be sin for us, condition, not birth. For he, God, has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made what? The right, there's that word again, the righteousness of God where? In Him. Everything is in Him. Amen. The moment you separate it, who's in charge? Satan is in charge. And that's my choice. To be in Him or not to be in Him. What did we learn in Galatians 4, 4 and 5? And when the fullness of the time had come, God sent His Son, born by the Immaculate Conception. Right? Am I quoting that right? No. no. Good. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born what? Under the condemnation of the law. Why? So that He could redeem those that were where? Under the condemnation of the law. Again, why did Jesus say to the woman in the synagogue, Thou art loosed from thine infirmity? What tense is, Thou art loosed? Present tense. Jesus says the same thing to each of us today. To whom? To every captive. He has proclaimed what? Deliverance, liberty, freedom, however, whatever adjective you want to use. The question is, do you and I believe that? Do you believe that Jesus identified with you at the incarnation? Amen. So that you can go to him every time you mess up? Yes. I don't know. It doesn't matter what I do wrong. Well, it does matter if I'm, unless I'm truly repentant. Okay? But if I'm truly repentant, Jesus says what? I'm the solution. Come, I'm waiting for you to communicate with me. Jesus is not concerned about my messing up. He's concerned about my motivation in messing up. Because if I take, turn my motivation over to him, what does he do with the verbs? They disappear. Isn't that a beautiful recipe? Yes, amen. But... You and I have to push that enter button.
These are all biblical facts, but facts, or faith does not make facts. Faith accesses facts, and then the facts become part through faith of Jesus Christ. Then they become a reality in our lives. What does all this mean? Matthew 28, 18 and 19. And Jesus called his disciples unto him and said unto them, All power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. What does that mean? That we now have all power and all authority. The power and the authority that was lost in Adam and Eve is now yours if you choose to exercise it. If we don't do this, it's because we choose not to. Because the Bible is very clear what Jesus has accomplished for the human race. Let's, uh, let's read, uh, who would like to read Ephesians 1? Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. Volunteer. Diana? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. There it is. Question is, am I going to access this, access this fact or not? By faith. That's the question. This is the inheritance to which you and I have been called. It's an inheritance. So the question is, for those that have been baptized into Jesus Christ is, let sin no longer reign in your mortal what? To make you obey what? The passions of our natural sinful nature. Is that awesome? Let's, let's go to Romans 6 verse 12. Who would like to read Romans 6 verse 12 for us? Romans 6, verse 12, volunteer, over here, Lois. Uh, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal eye, that you should obey it in its lust. Let sin no longer reign where? Sounds like we are the ones that have a choice in this. Now, this biblical fact means that in Christ, we have the authority over what? Sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Remember Romans 6, 14? Have you ever heard someone say, Oh Chuck, you're making a big deal about Christian living. We're saved by grace, Chuck. True. But what does the first part of verse 14 of Romans 6 say? Sin shall not have dominion. Right. Why? Why? Because of what Christ has done by taking on my sinful nature and crucifying it for 33 and a half years. So he genetically took on my nature, so legally he has what? Become my substitute. 
So is there any reason or excuse for any kind of sinning? Any kind of sin, according to Scripture. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Who decides that? You and I. Now, I'm making a point of this because there are a lot of explanations out there. What people say, oh, Chuck, you just, you're just not realistic. We're going to keep sinning until Jesus comes. And when I hear that, I say, my sinful nature would love for you to take me to Scripture and just show me, not ten, but just one Scripture that says, we're going to keep sinning until Jesus comes. Well, those that are not going to be taken to heaven will. But if you're planning on being up there, what does Scripture say? Sin will not have dominion over you. And the word here for sin is the condition. Your condition will not have dominion over you if you choose for it to not. I don't care who wants to explain that away from the truth. And there's a lot of explanation away from that. People say, well, Chuck, are you perfect? Are you living a sinless life? And I say, I don't know. But I trust the promise. Amen. Amen. And my faith is accessing the fact. Amen. I got news for you. I have a sinful nature. And when by the grace of God I'm living a sinless life, I'm not going to feel it. Why? Because I have a sinful nature. How can a person with a sinful nature feel that they're living a sinless life? That is absurd. Well, I know that I'm living a sinless life. No? How is that possible? Because I'm focused on what? Christ, where is he at? Holy Apartment number two. What's he doing there? He's appealing to us that we turn our lives over to him as he did what when he was on this earth? Turn his life over to his father. That's the recipe. It hasn't changed. Until we get this, we're not going to be identifying with Christ. Where he's at. As he identified with his heavenly father when he was here. The old, I mean, how many times did Jesus say, I myself can do nothing? Oh, my. John 5, 19, John 5, 30, John 14, 16. I mean, it is just endless how many times he said it. I myself can do nothing. When Satan tempted him, did he enter into a dialogue with Satan? No. Did he say to Satan, have you forgotten who created you up there? You're coming to me and tempting me? What's wrong with you? Moron? Did he do that? No. He said, what? It is written. And that is what we are admonished to do. It is written. I mean, how much better can this get? Is this not good enough? Do we need more? Has Jesus just simply not done enough to prepare us to take us up there and to be compatible with what? The atmosphere of heaven. This is a personal matter between us as individuals and God. You have to deal with this one-on-one -on -one with God. Yes, we get together here to study God's Word in Sabbath school. But we need to focus on what these words mean, these, what these concepts mean. Okay, let's take a look at Galatians 5.1. Who would like to read Galatians chapter 5, verse 1? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. We're finally going to get started with our study. <laughs> 45 minutes. Ago. Too long of an introduction. But we weren't here last Sabbath, so I thought it would be appropriate to review what we... Yeah. Galatians 5, verse 1. Who would like to read that for us? Okay. Okay. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Isn't that beautiful? There's that word free again. Stand fast. Why should we stand fast? It's not as light as everything. All we have to do is 
it's very easy to let go. It's very easy to say, oh, I think I'll drive by myself for a while, you know? That's a great illustration. I think I'll drive for myself for a while. I call the Holy Spirit God's designated driver because Jesus never chose to open up his, even his mouth to say anything, according to Scripture, according to Him. But He turned everything over to whom? The Holy Spirit. Here we have the Creator of the universe that created everything from nothing. He spoke and it was what? Boom! Done! How did that happen? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And the Spirit of God was what? Moving over the what? Chaos. And it's the Spirit of God that made everything happen. Yes, God is the master planner and Jesus is the one that executes. But who makes it happen? It's the Holy Spirit. The who? The paracletos. It's right here next to each one of us. Incredible concept. So, what does the word power mean? Our pastor preached on this. The first Sabbath in July. You know what his scripture was? Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power. And he explained what the Greek word power is. You know how, it's, what, how it sounds? Dynamitos. What does that phonetically sound like? Dynamite. Dynamite. It is the dynamite of God it also carries what? The performance of the act with it. What? I have some very, very special little seeds at home. How many of you like tomatoes? I love tomatoes. But these are very special tomatoes. Seeds. They are seeds of the purple... Uh, heirloom tomato. And in those little seeds, you have to be careful where you pick them up, they're so small. In that little seed, God has put the power of what? Germination. And you stick that little seed in the ground about an inch and a half and then you cover it, and what happens? Boom! Dynamite happens. <laughs> and that is what God's word is. It is the dynamite of God unto salvation. God is very symbolic and illustrates things beautifully through the inspired writers. I like that because I'm not too bright and I need to have everything explained to me. So, that's what it means to stand fast. Stand fast what? In the what? Boom! A dynamite of God. And you're the one that decides to, what you're going to dynamite. You're going to dynamite Satan out of the influence in your life? That's your choice. Or you can choose to be a slave to sin. That's our choice. Okay, what does verse 2 of Galatians 5 say? Who would like to read Galat verse 2 of Galatians 5? Volunteer? Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, it's true that circumcision today is not an issue from a religious standpoint. But is it an issue as far as the symbolism of circumcision? Was Paul circumcised yes. before he was a Christian? Yes. Yeah. Did he brag about it after he became a Christian? Yeah. No. no. He tells us in Philippians 3, yes. 1 through 7, he says, all of that is garbage. Yes. What day I was circumcised? Well, that was a Tribe of Benjamin, etc., etc., etc. Okay, I'm fighting the clock again. <laughs> Galatians 5, 3, and 4. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. 4. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. 
Obligation means that you're a debtor. A debtor to what? The law. What does the law require? Perfect. Righteousness. Can you perform that? Can you produce that? Okay, verse 5 of Galatians 5. This is the only verse in the Bible that uses the term righteousness by faith. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Six. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. In other words, faith which works. Not faith and works. But faith which works. What is the righteousness that the Spirit brings? The righteousness of Christ. Yes? So, with the Spirit brings what? The performance with it. Remember the little seed? And the dynamite in that seed? The germination? Some people say, well, but the passage says <clears throat> the hope of righteousness. It does not say that we through the Spirit hope for righteousness. It says what? The hope of, the hope of righteousness. Remember Romans 8, 9 and 10? You're no longer in front of you are no longer under the influence of the flesh, but of the Spirit. If so be it, that the what? Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Because if the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in you, you don't belong to Christ. Is that bad? Huh? Yes. That's yes. yes. good. The Spirit should be it. Verse 10. But if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, then the body and its condition becomes what? Dead to the sin condition. You like that? Why? Because the Spirit brings what? The life and the righteousness of Christ. The Spirit brings the performance with it. Because if it didn't, then it would be dependent on us to perform. That's not good. It doesn't work. So possessing the Holy Spirit guarantees the promise of God. And that is God's pledge to make the inheritance a reality in our lives. Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago to accomplish two things. Number two, to redeem us. But the first purpose was to vindicate the law of God, which Satan says, it's not fair, it's unjust. No one can live up to it. And most Christians have been convinced today that they're going to keep sinning until Jesus comes. Scripture is very clear that that's not only not possible, but no one's going up there that is knowingly, willingly, and deliberately continuing to sin. I would read Galatians 5, 7 through 12. Galatians 5, 7 through 12. You were running so well. You were doing so good. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? What? From obeying the law or the truth? Truth. What's the difference? People are focused on obeying the law. Got to do this, do this, do this, not this, not this, not this. The issue is what? Do we believe that all of these promises of God, which includes the Ten Commandments, because that's what the Ten Commandments are, Ten Promises. 
One writer, and I don't have time to read it, says that the commandments of God are a mirror. And the purpose is for us to see, number one, the character of God, and to see what we look like. Now we have a choice. Do I want to continue to look the way that I am now, or do I want to look the way that God looks? That's the purpose of the commandments, to give us a choice. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will what? Guard, cherish, protect, appreciate my what? My promises to you. This is God promising to us. That's where the witness is. People are focused on, well, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to get up earlier and pray more, I need to study my Bible more, I need to pay a gross tithe. Have you heard that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I need to change my diet. I mean, the list is endless. You know, folks? All of that is, I should do this, I ought to do this, and I must do this. That's all whole covered. That's what the entire book of Galatians is about. What is Jesus saying? Hey, I came down here to what? To vindicate the character of God and to redeem you in the process. I have a suggestion for you human beings. I'm now in the second apartment and I'm directly focused on your personal life as God was focused on my personal life when I was down there 2,000 years ago. I'm ready to close up shop on planet Earth. I'm looking for some people that will allow me to write my father's law in their what? God's still looking for that generation of people. Israel said, no, those people in the land of Canaan, there's no way we can conquer those people. God said, okay, you need to go out for another 40 year hike until you get focused on me. So the witness is in what the Holy Spirit is doing is where? What? <laughs> is that really correct? <laughs> That's the issue. That's where the witness is. When someone sees the character of God reproduced in you, will the advertising department in heaven say, Hey, this is the real deal. You need to buy this stuff. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. That's where the witness is. We need to mind our own business and let God mind His business. You know? That's what this comes down to. You were running so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from Him who called you. Nine, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you in the Lord. Where? In the Lord. In the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall be his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why in the name of common sense am I still being persecuted? Last part of 11. Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. What was the stumbling block for the Jews? Romans 9, 32. They wouldn't accept Jesus as their Messiah. Now verse 12, folks, I'm not going to get into any detail about this, but if you pay close attention to what I'm reading, you can figure out for yourself what Paul is saying. This is pretty nasty. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves as they circumcise you. And I'm not reading it to you in the Greek because that gets really fleshy. 13. For you were called to freedom, brother. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What kind of love is this talking about here? Agape love. What is agape love? From time to time I hear people say, Oh, my love is getting a little weak. But the Word of God says that God is love. There is no other love. It's God's love. Now I know that we 
love people, but generally that deals with reciprocity. If I say to Ricky, I'm willing to scratch your back if you will scratch my back. Is that a unilateral or is that a bilateral agreement? That's a bilateral agreement. If he doesn't scratch my back, what are the chances that I'm going to